Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you a story that I think will be vastly different than anything you've ever heard before. You know, we have a tremendous amount of arguing in this country between Democrats and Republicans, between liberals and conservatives, between radical leftists and radical rightists, most of whom all agree that we do have problems. They're not sure what the problems are. And a lot of people don't like to think that somebody else outside of their own group might have some valid ideas. It's a little bit like when you're a kid and you choose up sides on the playground to play a basketball game. Your side is the good guys and the other side is the bad guys and somehow you have moral superiority and the other side is totally evil. What we are going to describe today really goes across all political and ideological lines. They say most people believe there is something dramatically wrong in this country, but they're not sure what it is. Now what I'm going to try to do with this talk is to try to put this thing together in a sequence so that it will all make sense to you. Now what I have done is not make a bunch of brilliant new discoveries in this material that I'm giving to you. Most of the things that I talk about are readily verifiable at any large library, but they're scattered throughout the library. What I have done is put these events in the sequence which I believe most accurately reveals their true meaning and importance in American history. So a lot of people are aware of various individual things that are going on in this country and the things that I'll be talking about, but they didn't put them together in the right sequence. Now, I used to be a high school history teacher. Believe me, I did not put these things together in their proper sequence, although I was aware of many of these things, not all of them, but most people who've studied history are aware of a lot of these things, but they never put them together in their proper sequence. There are really only two theories of history. Either things happen because nobody wants them to happen, they just happen anyway, or the important events which shape our national destinies happen because somebody wants them to happen. Now, if you want to be socially and intellectually acceptable, you must believe that everything happens by accident. We are supposed to believe that events happen because there are some mysterious tides of history which propel men and events into happening and nobody ever wanted them to happen. I don't think what we're dealing with here is accumulated accident. I don't think that when our government stumbles from one blunder to another and keeps repeating those same blunders for administration after administration, that it can all be accidental. If you look at the consequences, it's not accidental. It's brilliant planning. Now, what I'm going to discuss with you tonight is the planning behind what is actually a conspiracy to gain power, political and economic power in this country and actually throughout the world. What I'm going to try to tell you tonight is something that is generally known as the communist conspiracy, and those are trigger words, is not run out of Moscow or Peiping. It's run out of New York, London, and Paris. And the outline that I'm going to give to you is not a theory which I created or hold. It is a network about which I have 
knowledge gained not only from extensive study, but also from talking to retired military intelligence officers and former congressional investigators. There are really uh, several thousand people in this country and many thousand around the world that know a great deal about this conspiracy. I'm going to try to convince you that communism is just an arm of a much bigger conspiracy. Everybody knows that a man named Adolf Hitler lived. Nobody disputes that. Adolf Hitler was a man raised in poverty, high school dropout, but a man with a tremendous emotional drive to rule others, to conquer the world. And we know this man sat up in a cold garret and wrote down exactly what he planned to do. And nobody disputes that. Nobody disputes the fact that Lenin lived. Lenin was another man from extremely modest background, largely self-educated, but a man who also had a fantastic drive for power over others. And we know that he sat up in dark, dank garrets in Switzerland and poured out into paper his plans for achieving that kind of power. Now, if somebody like Lenin or Hitler can sit up in a garret and plan to rule the world, is it not theoretically possible that a billionaire with the same evil motivation, the same craving for power over others, might sit up in his penthouse, might sit up in his penthouse in New York or London or Paris and dream the same dream that Lenin and Hitler had. I think you would have to admit that, that theoretically that is possible. We know that down through the ages there have been men like Alexander the Great and Caesar and people who had this lust for power. One reason why it is extremely difficult for the average American to believe that in this modern day and age there would be people with a similar motivation is the fact that the average person does not lust for power over his fellow human beings. The average guy marches to a far different drum. What does the average person want? He wants to be successful in his chosen profession. He wants to be financially comfortable. Wants to be able to take a vacation every year. Wants to provide for his family in sickness and in health. He does not lust for power over other human beings. And it is very difficult for him to comprehend the fact that there are those who do have that lust for power. People who are egomaniacs who think that they have the right to control the destinies of others. We must realize that it is theoretically possible that a billionaire might have the same perverted lust for power as a Hitler or a Lenin. And he would have a much better chance of carrying out his aims than would somebody that came from no wealth, no background, no social prestige like Hitler or Lenin. As a matter of fact, a billionaire might hire a Lenin or a Hitler to help carry out his schemes. Now, you can believe anything you want about communism except that it is a conspiracy run by people from the so-called legitimate world. You can believe that communism is evil, that communism wants to conquer the world. 
You can believe anything you want about it except that it is a conspiracy and that the conspiracy is run by people from the so-called legitimate world. Since everybody has a definition of communism, let me give you the one that I believe is the only truly accurate definition, and then I will proceed to try to prove that what I've said is the only logical definition. Communism is an international conspiratorial drive for power on the part of men in high places willing to use any means to bring about their desired aim, global conquest. Now you will notice that I did not mention dialectical materialism or Karl Marx or Frederick Engels. I didn't say anything about the philosophy of communism, of the pseudo-economics of communism. If we get all tied up in that bundle of snakes, then we bypass the essence of communism for the techniques. What most people think is communism are really just the techniques of communism. And if you do that, then you become fixated at the Gus Hall level or the Leonid Brezhnev level of communism. And that's not where it's at. Now, we are allowed to believe in some types of conspiracies. We can believe that businessmen conspire to fix prices. We can even believe that there is a, a conspiracy of organized crime. We can do that and not lose our social position within the community. Why can we do that? Well, because Life Magazine even admits that there is such a thing as organized crime. Now. It's very interesting to note that until Joseph Valachi testified before a congressional committee and told us that this group was known as the Cosa Nostra, now we didn't even know it by its right name. We thought the group was the Mafia. Now here's an organization that is well over a century old its leadership has been passed on generation to generation and operates internationally. And yet for over a hundred years, we didn't even know its right name. Now, isn't it possible that there might be a group working in politics doing the same thing and you might not know its name because they didn't have a Joseph Valachi? And Life Magazine didn't tell you about it? Let's draw another comparison with the Mafia. Most Mafia leaders had no education. They were born in slums. They got to the top of the crime anthill because they were vicious, they were ruthless, and they were cunning. Now what if the same type of grasping personality existed in somebody who was born into a patrician family of extreme wealth? And this person went to all the finest prep schools, went on to an Ivy League college, maybe did graduate work, in England, this person would have an infinite knowledge of economics, history, sociology, psychology. Is it likely that this type of person would then go out into the world and push marijuana to high school students, to sell numbers, to work down in a slum running a house of prostitution? Would he get involved in gangland murders? Of course not. A person with this background and this education would know that the lessons of history say, if you want big money and big power, get into the political business. 
get into the government business because that's where the big money and the big power is. And if you don't run for political office yourself, get somebody else who you control to run for you. Always better to operate through a front man. We're not supposed to believe that people like this would get into the political game. Now, we know all about the strivings for power in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, but we're supposed to think that somehow things have changed today. Actually, as you climb the historical ladder, the more power that a government has, the more people want to seize that power. Now, there are two facets of conspirators that we must remember. Two things they have to have in common. One is they have to be consummate liars. You can't get away with it unless you are a tremendous liar. Your success is going to be predicated on your ability to lie. Secondly, all conspirators are planners, careful, meticulous planners. They have to be. You have to know where you're going. You have to operate in secrecy. The whole idea of the smoke-filled rooms actually connotes planning. You know, there weren't too many things that FDR said that I agree with, but one of them was that if something happens in politics, you can bet it was planned that way. And I think he's a man who probably knew what he was talking about on that subject. Now, we have defined communism as a tyranny of power seekers, and their most powerful weapon is the big lie. There are two major lies of communism from which all others spring. There's lots of lies of communism, but there's two main ones. All others are derivative from those. The first lie is that communism is inevitable. The second lie is that communism is a movement of the downtrodden masses rising up against exploiting bosses. Marx said the communists of the world must work to establish socialism, the dictatorship of the proletariat. We can't have communism until we have socialism. Now you go hear any communist speaker on a college campus, you go down to a, any official Communist Party bookstore and you look at their literature or you listen to their speakers, they never talk about bringing communism to the United States. They always say we must finish the socialization of the United States. All communists work for socialism. Now, when you have to have a definition of socialism, don't we? What is socialism? Well, you can go to almost any dictionary and look up socialism, and it will say something about government ownership and or control over the means of production and distribution of goods and services. This is the definition of socialism that the socialists want you to accept. I believe it is not an accurate or true definition of socialism. Socialism in reality is not a divide the wealth program. It is a movement to consolidate and control the wealth. It does not produce a classless society. It produces two classes the elite and the proletariat with no middle class. The idea that socialism is a share of the wealth program has nothing to do with the realities of the situation. Let's look at the only countries in the world that call themselves socialists. By those I mean the communist countries, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, 
the People's Democratic Socialist Republic of North Vietnam. Who runs these countries? Do the people run them? Are things owned in common? No, they're run by a tiny oligarchy at the top. And the reality of it is that 3% of the people totally control the fortunes, the property, and the very lives of the other 97%. Even the most naive are able to observe that Brezhnev does not live the same kind of life as the poor peasant out on the great Russian steppes. Yet according to socialist theory, he is supposed to, isn't he? If you understand that socialism in reality is a consolidate and control the wealth program, then the seeming paradox of power-hungry, super-rich promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. In fact, it becomes a logical extension for all power seekers. If you believe that socialism is inevitable, then it's useless and futile to fight against it. And most Americans today believe that socialism is inevitable. And that's exactly what the communists and the super rich want you to believe. Now one way in which they make you believe it is inevitable is through the definitions of the political spectrum. Now on this first chart, we have what is commonly accepted by about 95% of the people as the political spectrum in this country. What the political science professor will say to you is something like this. On the far left of the political spectrum, we have communism. And they will usually admit that communism is dictatorial. But then in the next breath, they will say, but on the other end of the spectrum, and equally to be feared, we have the extreme right wing, which is fascism, which is also a dictatorship. Now what we all want is to stay in this middle of the road, in democracy, by which of course they mean Fabian or creeping socialism. So what is the spectrum that the American people are given? You can have on the far left international socialism or communism, or you can have the far right national socialism or fascism, or the middle of the road, which is Fabian socialism. Now, if you accept these definitions, you have to believe that socialism is inevitable because the whole spectrum is socialist. Now, if you stop and think about it, this spectrum, which almost everybody accepts, is totally fallacious. Where do you put somebody on this spectrum who is an anarchist, who doesn't believe in any government at all? Where do you put somebody on this spectrum who believes in the free enterprise system and a limited constitutional government? There's no place on the spectrum for them. Now there is what I think is a much more rational political spectrum, one that I think we should think in terms of. On the far left, you have total government. And it doesn't make any difference what type of name is attached to total government. Whether you call it communism or fascism or socialism or pharaohism or Caesarism, whatever it is, it's the same thing for the people who have to live and suffer under it. Total government means that the state is all powerful, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the people have no rights. Now, if the far left is total government, under any of the names you want to tack onto it, what logically would be the opposite of total government? Well, very obviously, the opposite of total government is no government. So if you wanted to be totally logical, the extreme right should be anarchy or no government at all. The founding fathers of this country had had 
experience under King George III of almost total government. And that's what they rebelled against. So they knew they wanted to set up something different. What they gave this country was a limited government, a constitutional republic, where the government had as little power as was possible consummate with keeping order. They knew if you didn't have any, any government at all, you'd have just chaos. Thomas Jefferson said, Speak to me not of men, but bind them down with the chains of a constitution. The whole idea of the United States Constitution was to enslave the government, to put the government in chains. If in high school civics classes they taught that one thing and didn't teach them anything else, you could dismiss class after the first day and the kids would know 10,000% more than they ever knew before or they're ever taught. A constitution is to enslave the government because the founding fathers knew that if you don't enslave the government, the government eventually will enslave the people. It's happened every single time in history. Now starting shortly after the turn of the century, we burst those chains of the Constitution and we have been moving leftward across this political spectrum ever since. More and more towards total government and we are getting very close to total government today. Our Constitution divided up governmental power and fractionalized it in every way they could conceive of. Power within the federal government was divided between the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Other powers were given to the states, which further subdivided the power among courts, city government, and county government. And there were many facets of our life that our founding fathers believed were so important they didn't want the politicians to get their hands on them. Such things as education, the local police, charity, business, and to a large degree even finance and labor. Now what has happened is since we have burst these chains of the Constitution, all of these independent sectors that we had originally, all these divided powers, have now been brought together, like bringing together all the, the strands of wheat in a wheat field so that they all come together at the top. Now, whatever facet of our life you're dealing with, whether it is labor, finance, business, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, the states, counties, cities, charity, police, education, all is being put under the control of the executive branch of the federal government. This is the power pinnacle at the executive level. Now, if you don't remember anything from this talk, please remember what I'm about to tell you now. Under a constitutional republic, it is absolutely impossible to have a dictatorship. The reason is that no person can get his hands on enough power to be a dictator. Under the form that we are rapidly arriving at in this country, where everything is under the executive branch, you can't avoid a dictator. A dictator becomes inevitable. As Lord Acton said, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We're putting absolute power in the executive branch of the federal government. Now, let's say that you and I were conspirators and we wanted to take over the country. We knew you have to take over the country. You have to control the government. Under a constitutional republic, there's no way you could gain control of the government. Here, when all power is in the executive branch of the government, you only have to control one man, don't you? And you gain virtual de facto control of every other facet of American life. Now, under a constitutional republic, there's only one type of economic system that is possible. 
and that is the competitive free enterprise system. Because the Constitution didn't give the government po power to set up a fascist or socialist communist government. All other forms of government, all collectivist forms of government require more power in the government than our founding fathers gave the United States government in the Constitution. You know, often uh, students will say to you in sort of sneering terms, well, I suppose you believe that uh, uh, God created the free enterprise system. Uh, and they'll say to you, you know, uh, uh, the free enterprise system isn't mentioned in the Constitution. They're right, it is not mentioned in the Constitution, but it is the only possible system under a constitutional republic. The only possible economic system where you have all power in the executive is a form of socialism. Whether you call it fascism or Nazism or communism, whatever you call it, the, the bureaucrats at the top are going to dictate who produces what and how much you get paid. You can't have a dictatorship without wage and price controls. And you can't have a free country with them. Every dictatorship in the history of the world has wage and price controls. If you think that remark is pointed, it is. But when you go down to your corner banker and you borrow money from him for your business, he then gains a voice in how that business is run, doesn't he? He may even get a seat on uh, the board of directors. And when you have this situation, when you're loaning money to the king or the premier or whatever he happens to be called, you can ask for certain favors. And there was one favor above all that the Rothschilds and their fellow international bankers in Europe wanted from the king. That was a monopoly on the issuing of money. They wanted control over the central banks of these countries. Because if you control the central bank of one country, you can become fabulously wealthy. If you control the central banks of a number of countries, uh, the profits you can make are absolutely fantastic. The Rothschilds did gain control of the central banks in Europe. Most people would assume, for instance, that the Bank of England was owned by the, the English government. It wasn't. It was privately owned. The Bank of France was privately owned. The Bank of Germany was privately owned. The Bank of Italy was privately owned. The Bank of Holland was privately owned. Now, during the 19th century, there was a young country across the Atlantic Ocean that was becoming very powerful economically. And the Rothschilds wanted to have that same kind of monopoly control over a central bank in the United States that they enjoyed in European countries. The Rothschilds and their allies wanted control of a central bank in the United States. Now, if you remember from your history, the United States Central Bank, the, the Bank of the United States, was killed by Andrew Jackson in 1837. Now, I majored in history in college, and. I took all the high school courses and all kinds of college courses and postgraduate courses, and I must have studied that Bank of the United States, you know, Biddle's Bank and the thing with Jackson. I studied that over and over and over again. I never understood what it was about. And I don't think anybody else does either. It was simply a grab for power by private international bankers over the money supply of the United States. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913. The Federal Reserve allowed the government to go in debt. The national debt in 1913, over a hundred and some years of existence of the United States government was one billion dollars. We'd had the War of 1812, we'd had the war with Mexico, we'd had the tremendously expensive Civil War, we'd had the Spanish-American War, and yet the total debt of this country was $1 billion. The international bankers were not making much money off the United States of America. Before Woodrow Wilson left office, the national debt had increased 
800%. We are now paying about 24 to 25 billion dollars a year just in interest on the national debt. That's the third largest item in the federal budget. And it, within a very few years, that's going to be 30 billion and 40 billion and 50 billion dollars a year just on the debt. So now the conspirators, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers and their allies, had a mechanism to run the debt up. But running the debt up isn't any good if you can't collect on it. So America had to have a graduated income tax. Six plank of the Communist Manifesto. They had to make people pay for it. They had to be able to collect that what is now $22 billion. Who would you think would be in favor of a progressive income tax? And who would you think would be opposed? Well, just logic tells you that uh, poor people would probably be in favor of it and wealthy people would probably be opposed to it. And in many cases, that's true. But the man who introduced the progressive income tax law into the United States Senate was Nelson Aldrich, the floor man for J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller. I said, well, that doesn't make sense. After all, since they were the richest guys in the country, wouldn't they have to pay the taxes on a progressive income tax? Well, they'd thought of that part of it, too. Even before they introduced this law, they set up a gimmick called tax-free foundations, where they took themselves out of the tax stream and put the burden on everybody else. Now, if you can do that, you get to compound your wealth tax-free. At the same time, all your competitors are trying to acquire capital under a progressive income tax. Remember, socialism is not divide the wealth, it's consolidate and control the wealth. You put the tax burden on your competitors. You take yourself out. What were the first two foundations that were formed? Rockefeller and Carnegie. Carnegie and Morgan put together U.S. Steel. When they were talking about busting up the trust, what were the two major trusts that the government supposedly broke up? Rockefeller, Standard Oil, Carnegie, U.S. Steel. First two tax-free foundations. So the conspirators at this point had three major tools. They had the tool, the Federal Reserve, to run the debt up. They had the mechanism to collect the debt, and they had their own personal bailout in the form of tax-free foundations. Why well, you know, how do you get a government to go in debt? They had the mechanism now, it was all set. You, you, gotta, you gotta get the government to go in debt. When times are normal, things are cooking along pretty good. There's no big excuse for the government to go in debt. What is the number one excuse for a government going in debt? War. Now, you will remember that Woodrow Wilson, that great apostle of the common man, ran for president in 1916 under the slogan, He kept us out of war. Very similar to a man in 1940 who said, our sons are not going into a foreign war. At the same time, both of these guys were preparing to do just exactly that. At the time Woodrow Wilson was running for re-election in 1916, through Colonel House, the international banker's front man who was the Henry Kissinger of the Woodrow Wilson administration, had already committed themselves to going to war on the side of England in World War I. Now, World War I is another one of those things that you can study over and over again, and if you can ever make rhyme or reason out of it, please explain it to me. We had no business in that war. It was absolutely contrary to American tradition to get involved in European wars. After all, the Rothschilds always had one European country at war with another European country. We had always stayed out. The Lusitania was sunk two years before the United States entered World War I. 
The Lusitania was a reserve cruiser in the British Navy. It was carrying munitions that J.P. Morgan was selling to England. J.P. Morgan was the official British financial agent in America during World War I. The German government had a blockade on England, and England had a blockade on Germany. Now, if J.P. Morgan wanted to take the risks and reap the profits of selling munitions to Great Britain, that was certainly his prerogative, but it was nothing that we should have gotten dragged into a war about. The German government bought advertising and newspapers actually handed flyers to, to people as they boarded the Lusitania, saying this is a ship of war, it is carrying munitions, when it enters the British Isles, we must sink it. So you go on this ship at your own risk. It was actually illegal for an American civilian to be on a British ship of war carrying munitions. Yet that incident was turned into a justification for the United States getting involved in World War I. Now the tragedy that was World War I is so tremendous that most people even if they don't realize it changed our entire foreign policy. We've been involved almost ever since in perpetual war for perpetual peace. We sent our money and our boys all around the world, all because of what we started in World War I. Another thing that happened during World War I that is extremely important was that in the chaos of World War I, the Bolsheviks, the Communists, seized power in Soviet Russia. Now, quite obviously, the entire history of the world has been changed because of the Bolsheviks seizing power in Russia. Almost all Americans believe that the Communists were able to successfully overthrow the Tsar, but the Communists did not overthrow the Tsar. The communists took over Russia in October of 1917. The Tsar abdicated in April. People forget about that. You're not supposed to remember that. The Tsar abdicated and was succeeded originally by Prince Lvov, who wanted to set up a government pattern after our own government, but he had the power taken away from him by Kerensky. And Kerensky then uh, was quite obviously a front man for the communists and the international bankers. He invited a quarter of a million communists who had been exiled from Russia after the abortive revolution of 1905. He invited those people back home to Russia. They came home all right. Uh, Kerensky bailed out and the communists took over. Now, at the time the Tsar abdicated, where were the two men whose names we most closely associate the communist revolution with? One is Trotsky, the other is Lenin. Lenin was in Switzerland, where he'd been in exile in Western Europe since 1905. Trotsky was in New York City. He was a reporter for a communist newspaper in New York City. Trotsky, after he heard that the Tsar had resigned, Trotsky got on a boat, SS Christiana, in New York to head back for Russia. He was stopped at the first port of call, which was Nova Scotia. The Canadians threw him in jail. And their reasoning was something like this. Trotsky, you said over and over again if, that if you're successful in coming to power in Russia, that you will make peace with the Germans. That will allow the Germans to take hundreds of thousands of soldiers that are now fighting in the east and put them into the western front where they'll kill Canadian soldiers. So Trotsky, you're not going anywhere, and they threw him in jail, where he cooled his heels for five days. Because Colonel House, the 
Kissinger that the international bankers put in beside Woodrow Wilson pressured the British government to force the Canadians to let Trotsky go. So Trotsky and his 274 other revolutionaries from New York City, along with considerable amounts of money, went back to Russia. At the same time, a, a fellow in Germany, Max Warburg, the brother of Paul Warburg, the father of the Federal Reserve System, sent Lenin, along with six million dollars in gold, across Europe at war from Switzerland back to Russia. Trotsky and Lenin joined up and overthrew the Kerensky government. Now, according to his grandson, Jacob Schiff, brother-in-law of Paul Warburg, the man who the Rothschilds sent to the United States to gain control of railroads over here, according to Schiff's grandson, Jacob Schiff spent $20 million financing the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The money was sent in through banks in Sweden. Cousin Max Warburg spent $6 million. Now this is interesting. Paul Warburg is now running the Federal Reserve of the United States, financing the World War I for the American side. His brother Max Warburg has the exact same position in Germany. Max Warburg sends Lenin with money to Russia. His father-in-law, Jacob Schiff, sends Trotsky with $20 million to Russia, where they joined up. Almost every American believes that the communists were successful in Russia because they were able to mobilize behind them the downtrodden masses against the exploiting czar. Nothing could be further from the truth. The downtrodden masses did not call Trotsky and Lenin back. Some of the richest and most powerful men in the world sent them in. And they didn't rally the masses, but with this money, they were able to buy up enough soldiers and bribe enough officials that through cunning and trickery and deceit, they were able to take over Russia and set up a Bolshevist state. Now, there were other people involved in financing the Bolshevik Revolution. This story has been pretty well known for a long time. Well known to military intelligence at the time. The fact that Warburg and Schiff were involved financing Trotsky. Recently, evidence has come up to show that also involved in financing Lenin and Trotsky were J.P. Morgan and Company in New York, Alfred Milner, who was the Rothschild representative in England. He actually, uh, Alfred Milner, served as a bag man and took money into Russia to pay off the people they were bribing. So here we have a movement, communism, which we are told is a movement of the downtrodden masses to take away the wealth of the super rich and we find out it's the super rich who are bankrolling the whole affair. What it amounts to is that for somewhere in the neighborhood of about thirty million dollars these people bought themselves a geographic homeland for their conspiracy they bought themselves a wedge to use against the west and they bought a tremendous piece of real estate complete with mineral rights now today you can't even buy a big building in downtown los angeles for thirty million dollars they bought themselves a whole country and they have worked ever since that time to keep that country alive. Lenin, during the 1920s, established what he called the new economic policy. He invited the Harrimans, the Rockefellers, and the Vanderlips, these same people, back into Russia to develop the economy of Russia. A professor at Stanford, by the name of Anthony Sutton, 
has put out a three volume study called Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development, probably the most important series of books written this century. He shows without a doubt that Soviet Russia is totally a product of Western technology and finance, primarily American. In other words, the USSR was built in the USA from the financing of the revolution to keeping it alive today. Now, let us recap here for a second. We have the same little clique of men who set up the Federal Reserve System, who set up the graduated income tax, who set up the foundation system so they wouldn't have to pay the taxes, who pushed us into World War I and who bankrolled the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The same guys. One of the things that the conspirators hope to get out of World War I, besides setting up their geographic base in, in Russia, was a world government. Their ultimate goal is a world government. That world government was to take the form of the League of Nations. When the United States refused to join a world government after World War I, there was no world government. You couldn't have a world government if the most powerful nation in the world refused to participate. So these people had to set up an organization to condition the American people to accept a world government. That organization was set up in New York and was called the Council on Foreign Relations. It is very doubtful that if one person in a thousand knows anything at all about the Council on Foreign Relations, and yet it is probably the single most powerful organization in the United States today. Who is involved with the Council on Foreign Relations? Well, it was started by the same clique, the old Federal Reserve clique, with Jacob Schiff, Paul Warburg, Frank Vanderlip, the Rockefeller family, Bernard Baruch, J.P. Morgan. Among the membership of the Council on Foreign Relations today are the heirs of these international bankers, with such firms as Kuhn Loeb and Company, Lazard Frere, Dylan Reed, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, Chase Manhattan Bank, and Morgan Garrity. Among the big corporations represented in the Council on Foreign Relations are Standard Oil, IBM, Xerox, Eastman Kodak, Pan American Airways, Firestone Tire and Rubber, and U.S. Steel. Also involved with heavy membership in the Council on Foreign Relations are members of the Americans for Democratic Action, a very avowedly socialist group, the League for Industrial Democracy, United World Federals, other world government leftist groups. Now, the average person would think that these people uh, in the ADA and such are very strange bedfellows for these international bankers, because most people don't realize that international bankers want a world government. If you want control over a nation's economy, you want control over that nation's government. If you want control over the economy of the world, then you want control over a world government. Now, also involved with the Council on Foreign Relations have been such labor leaders as Jay Lovestone, David Dubinsky, and Walter Ruther. These labor leaders are supposed to be the blood enemies of people like Standard Oil and IBM and Xerox, and yet they're in the same fraternity. They're in the same lodge. Also, you have involved the foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford, and Carnegie Foundation. A tr 50% of the people in the Council on Foreign Relations have at one time or another served in the executive branch of the federal government. Also involved with membership in the Council on Foreign Relations, you have all of the main picture painters, the main landscape painters in the United States. NBC, CBS, Time, Life, Fortune, Look, Newsweek, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, New York Post, McGraw-Hill, Simon & Schuster, Harper Brothers, 
Book of the Month, Saturday Review, and Business Week. That's virtually a monopoly over the communications industry in the United States of America. Now, since they have a virtual control over communications in the United States, if they wanted the people of this country to know anything about the CFR, don't you think that somehow they could get a, a little news release printed somewhere? Sure they could. Now, there's, in other words, they want to remain secret. They don't want you to know about them. The control of the CFR over our political parties is also almost total. Some of the key Democrats, Democrat branch one of uh, the CFR, include Dean Acheson, Alger Hiss, Adlai Stevenson, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, now Teddy Kennedy, Averill Harriman, George Ball, Henry Fowler, Dean Rusk, Hubert Humphrey, John Lindsay. Now, it's interesting, probably the worst Secretary of the Treasury we ever had was Henry Fowler. When he left the Johnson administration, he was given a job by the Rothschilds. Now, maybe they just took pity on him. Um, and George Ball also left the Johnson administration, went to work for Lehman Brothers, which is another major international banking firm. Let's look at the CFR Republicans, CFR Team B. I'm giving you a choice, you can have CFR Team A or CFR Team B. And you get people into all kinds of arguments about which is the best team. The CFR Republican team has included Dwight Eisenhower, John Foster Dulles, Thomas E. Dewey, Jacob Javits, Paul Hoffman, Robert McNamara, John Gardner, Henry Cabot Lodge, and as you might guess, more Rockefellers than you can shake a stick at. Such members of the Nixon administration as Elliot Richardson, Arthur Burns, Henry Kissinger, and Richard Nixon himself. When Richard Nixon was running for president of the United States, he told Congressman John Ashbrook that the first thing he was going to do when he was elected was get rid of the CFR internationalists in the government. What did he do? He appointed as the virtual assistant president of the United States, Henry Kissinger, who was on the paid staff of the Council on Foreign Relations, and was Nelson Rockefeller's uh, chief advisor on foreign policy affairs. Richard Nixon appointed 112 members of the Council on Foreign Relations to high jobs in his administration. Now, the goal, remember, the goal of the CFR, very simply stated, is this. It's to eliminate the United States. The United States is a sovereign government. If you're going to put it in a world government, then you abolish the United States. It's as simple as that. What we have is a two-party system, Team A of the CFR and Team B of the CFR. Now, the grassroots Republicans and the grassroots Democrats are usually very different. But as you go up the sides of the political pyramid, the parties become more and more alike until you disappear behind what I call the managed news curtain and you find that at the apex of both parties, you have the CFR. Two parties, one ideology. See, they get you arguing about which is the better group because not one American in a thousand understands that we have the same clique that runs both parties. And until Americans understand that, they're going to keep going through the same confusion of throwing the, the group that's in out and getting the same thing when they replace them. Until you understand this concept, then we're just doomed to total frustration in trying to solve any of our problems through politics. To coordinate this world government movement, they even have an international organization. It's called the Bilderbergers. The Bilderbergers was put together by Prince Bernard of Holland. He heads the Shell Oil Company, which is a pretty big company. The American promoter of the, of the Bilderberger group is the Rockefellers, who control Standard Oil and Chase Manhattan. The name comes from the hotel where they had their first meeting in Holland. Among the Americans involved with the 
Bilderberger Organization or Henry Kissinger, George Ball, Joseph E. Johnson, Dean Acheson, McGeorge Bundy, Arthur Dean, Christian Herder, John J. McCloy, every one of them CFR. Now these people get together to decide the policies of their various governments. Wouldn't you think that would be newsworthy? How about, you know, the, the New York Times is always screaming about the public's right to know. Well, you go down the library and look at the New York Times index and you try to find out anything about the Bilderbergers, which is an offshoot of the CFR, and there's something like nine people from the New York Times who are CFR members. Now, they had a meeting in the United States last spring attended by Henry Kissinger, and Prince Bernard did give one interview. They don't let it, any newspaper men attend their meetings. And he did give one interview before, and he said, uh, well, we're going to discuss American world policy. Now, isn't it nice to get all these international bankers together with people from our government and have a secret meetings to decide our international policies? And shortly after this group met, two things happened. One, China was opened up, and two, the dollar was devalued. Now, I cannot prove to you that that was a direct result of this meeting, because this meeting is secret, and I can't find out what went on there. But it is rather coincidental. It is also rather coincidental that one of the largest reserves of oil in the world has just been discovered off the coast of China and is now being developed by Standard Oil. So they've opened up the Chinese oil market through their representative in the United States government, Henry Kissinger. And an awful lot of people in this country are ups upset about the Vietnam War, and they well should be, but most of them are upset for the wrong reasons and they don't know really what is going on there. The Vietnam War will be used as an excuse to make you accept wage and price controls, a totally government-regulated economy, and eventually, as the answer to all of our problems, submitting to a world government. The American people are being put in a vice. They're getting pressure from above and pressure from below. From below, you have the Black Panthers, SDS, the Yippies, the Young Socialist Alliance, the radicals out in the street. What are they saying? They're saying, change the America or you're going to lose it. Now, what do they mean by change? They mean socialism. That's what they mean by change. And at the top, you have the Rothschild, CFR, Rockefeller clique saying, we've got to change America. We've got to have socialism. These people have been working in this country for six decades anyway. They've made tremendous progress. Whether they are successful or not is going to depend on what happens between now and November. The most crucial six months and the history of the United States are ahead of us. It all depends upon whether you people want to save your freedom as much as the other people want to enslave it. Now, I don't mean that we have to elect a president of the United States. I, I think it's a long shot to believe we can. We can elect enough congressmen to stand up to this. Everything these people have been working on for 60 years could come unglued almost overnight if a significant percentage of the people understood what the con game is all about. We now have, I think, a tool that can destroy these conspirators before they destroy us. We can do it if we move fast enough and if we move hard enough. I've worked with a number of other people to create the tool.